announcement of the Hain Banking Royal Commission in November 2017. Now, in these slides, you can see that what the parties um, or what Austrac alleged and what CBA admitted in June 2018. Um, so they failed to carry out a proper assessment of money laundering um, and counterterrorism financing risks of the intelligent deposit machines, which were first rolled out in 2012 by the CBA. Now, the way they worked was the CBA allowed up to 200 notes per transaction. So that meant a maximum of $20,000, which was um, above the $10,000 threshold that triggers the um, uh, obligation on, on the, the banks to lodge a, a threshold transactions report with Austrac. They also allowed an unlimited number of transactions per customer. And the IDMs also allowed an anonymous cash deposit. So what that meant was that money could be deposited um, and move very quickly. So there was a big risk um, in terms of money laundering and, and terrorism financing. So the bank failed to have appropriate controls to mitigate and manage those risks. It failed to provide the appropriate reports to Austrac. So basically it wasn't complying with its own program. And even, it, even after it became uh, or suspected that there was money laundering, the CBA didn't monitor its customers to mitigate and manage those risks. Now, an agreement was reached uh, where Austrac and the CBA agreed that the bank would pay a then record $700 million penalty, which was later eclipsed by Westpac's $1.3 billion penalty. It was also agreed that none of the contraventions were the result of any intention to breach uh, money laundering laws. Rather, everything pointed to deficiencies in oversight, accountabilities and resources in respect of AML CTF compliance and risk management functions. And then as flagged, this led to more, uh, sorry, this led to, okay, just trying to move to the next one. Not sure what happened. The pointer isn't working. Where's, where's Ashley? It's not moving on to the next slide. I'm not sure what I should do here. Um, just use it. But that wasn't working either. It's stuck. Yeah, it's stuck. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so the other regulators involved were APRA. Oh, sorry, I just need to go back. So there was the APRA inquiry and it reported in uh, May 2018 and it actually led to an enforceable undertaking being negotiated from the CBA. I'll talk more about what that enforceable undertaking involved in a minute. But um, the key findings of the this APRA report were um, they identified cultural failings um, in CBA's culture, including a culture of complacency and insularity and as well as that, the key findings were that the bank's impressive and ongoing um, financial success meant that uh, two critical voices, the voice of risk and the voice of and the customer voice were muted and not heard. And this was particularly so in relation to non-financial risks. So there was this emphasis on um, making money, pursuing profit at the expense of um, conduct um, issues, for example. So I won't read all these out. You can see what these sorts of um, problems that were identified. I might just mention one though, an operational risk management framework that emphasised process rather than outcomes. In other words, a tick the box approach to compliance that worked better on paper than in practice, supported by an immature and under-resourced compliance function. Um, also things like complex and bureaucratic decision-making, shortcomings in risk management. Okay, what with the Hain Banking Royal Commission, there were similar themes uh, found in the um, in in the final report, um, such as a culture of complacency uh, throughout the organisation that discouraged identifying any problems in the business, um, a short term, an overly short term perspective focusing on profit, um, and and the remuneration uh, systems that it, that reinforced it. Okay, we also had ASIC. What did, what did our corporate regulator do? 
it decided to take no action against either CBA, so the organisation, or any individual directors or senior managers, and it made that decision in August 2020. As far as the CBA itself is concerned, since these issues have been identified, um, there's been material changes in the composition of its board, its management, and also improvement in risk management. And there has been a completion of uh, CBA's remedial action plan that it entered into under the enforceable undertaking. Um, and that's been evidenced by reports from the independent third party um, promontory who has reported on its on the implementation of that plan. Um, and also APRA reduced, there was a, um, a billion dollar capital overlay that had been applied to the CBA and um, 500 was reduced from a billion to 500 million in November 2020, with the balance removed in September 2022. Okay, moving on now to Crown. So we had three commissions of inquiry in New South Wales, Victoria and WA, reporting in 2021 and 2022. They all issued uh, very uh, critical reports and all reports made findings that Crown was not suitable to operate casinos in their states. At this point, I might just mention that in Australia, casinos are principally regulated by state legislation specific to casinos. So we have state regulators where regulatory control is through a licensing system and where regulators are required to undertake regular reviews of casinos. The key findings of, of these inquiries were that Crown for many years engaged in illegal, dishonest, unethical and exploitative conduct, to use the words of the Victorian Royal Commission. And these were the key themes that were um, that, that appear in all these inquiries, facilitating money laundering, permitting junkets with links to criminals, failing to be open and accountable with the regulator. So I've just highlighted some of them. What were the reasons? identified for the behaviour were contributory issues with the regulatory framework, regulators and government. The Western Australian Royal Commission was particularly uh, critical of the framework and the way that regulators carried out their roles. Um, and look, I'll just mention one of these, um, poor risk uh, management in relation to re responsible gambling, in that Crown had res a responsible gambling code of conduct in which it stated that it was a world leader in responsible gambling practices and that it was committed to protection, to customer protection through rigorous staff training and problem gambling intervention. But its practices didn't align with those statements at all. In fact, Crown's culture, with its overriding emphasis on profit, didn't encourage staff to report problem gamblers. And in fact, staff remuneration packages rewarded staff on how much gamblers spent, uh, not for identifying and intervening in problem gambling. So culture was a, a problem, a deficient culture, um, driving profit above all else, including uh, meeting their legal and uh, regulatory requirements. Okay, as far as the regulators are concerned, how did they respond? Um, again, Austrac initiated civil penalty proceedings uh, against uh, Crown after two years of investigations. That happened in March 2022. Uh, Crown is still reviewing its statement of claim. Uh, there have been some reports in the media recently criticising Austrac's tardiness in bringing this matter to court, um, but we need to see what happens. As far as uh, ASIC is concerned, again, it decided not to take any action against Crown or any, any individual, so it's 10 former directors and senior executives in relation to their financial crime and governance failings. And that decision was also made in March 2022. As far as the state uh, gaming regulators are concerned, despite findings of unsuitability in all three states, all, they seem uh, more intent on keeping Crown operating even though fines and um, other conditions have been imposed while remedial action is being undertaken by Crown. For example, the appointment of special managers and a, and a penalty of $80 million, uh, which was imposed on uh, Crown Victoria. Crown itself, again, there's been significant change in the board and senior management 
but it's yet to be seen what changes have been made to risk conduct and AML CTF. And there will likely be less visibility over this than uh, the CBA's public reports. The other thing to note is the takeover by the private equity firm Blackstone um, has been approved by shareholders, by the federal court and by the uh, state regulators, and that was completed in June 2022. Let's now compare the key themes. So in both cases, they led to in several inquiries which, which issued damning reports. So CBA won by APRA and then the Hain Banking Royal Commission with Crown commissions of inquiry in three different states. In both governance failures and poor culture were found to be root causes of wrongdoing, but the key difference was um, in the assessment of intention. As far as the CBA is concerned, none of the contraventions were found to be a consequence of any deliberate intention to breach the legislation. The issues were largely due to a, the, a culture of complacency, poor practices, and inadequate uh, resources devoted to risk and compliance functions. Whereas it has, there are indications that things were different at Crown. It, it, was a, a, it seemed to have a corporate culture that actively encouraged risk-taking in financial crime, uh, where there was evidence of considerable knowledge of wrongdoing within Crown by its different teams, knowledge that they ignored, um, where the inexorable focus on profit was to the detriment of everything else, um, including compliance. And there are actually examples that have been uh, singled out by the Victorian Royal Commission, such as the 2016 arrest and imprisonment of 19 China-based Crown staff in circumstances where Crown executives had been warned of the crackdown. Now, is this difference important? I think it is, in that while it might be easy to dismiss these cases as outliers, uh, the CBA case demonstrates that cultural issues are not necessarily intentional or unique. In short, what happened at CBA could likely happen in any organisation. Next, both cases led to enforcement action by Austrac against the organisations, but not against any individual associated with um, money laundering. Uh, and the, the purpose of, of these uh, actions has been deterrence to send a strong deterrence message to the market as well as specific uh, deterrence. As far as um, ASIC is concerned, in both cases, ASIC took no action against either CBA or Crown or any um, individual directors and or executives, although we have seen that both cases led to board changes. Now, board changes were not the result of regulatory pressure, but rather um, uh, investor and public pressure based on the idea that um, uh, 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 that tone from the top that um, it sets the culture of an organisation, that board members, when there's wrongdoing, need to take responsibility and, and resign. So let's explore the reasons why um, reg regulators, in particular ASIC, why haven't they issued any proceedings? Um, particularly against the directors um, and, and or senior executives of these, these organisations, despite the court of public opinion determining otherwise. Now, I've, I've set up or I've set out some hypotheses here. One is that ASIC didn't take action because Austrac had taken at least some action. And I think what the, this uh, problem uh, or this hypothesis uh, highlights is gaps and overlaps in the roles and responsibilities of different regulators. There are also the well-known difficulties associated with litigation, um, the complexity of the evidence, the context, so very difficult to sheet home uh, responsibility to any individual director or senior executive, particularly in large organisations, uh, meeting the high standard of proof in both criminal cases, uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and even in civil penalty cases, Although the, um, the, the uh, burden of proof is supposed to be on the balance of probabilities, that is the civil standard, the courts have consistently insisted on the more onerous Brigginshaw standard of reasonable satisfaction, which is very close to the criminal standard. And here it's telling that Joe Logo, the current chair of um, 
Joe Longo, I should say, the current chair of ASIC, has uh, alluded to the fact that, you know, one of the reasons or the main reason why um, ASIC didn't take any action against the Crown directors or senior executives was lack of evidence. Um, it's kind of a, uh, there are also the cost delays and uncertainties associated with legal enforcement action, particularly against um, uh, uh, defendants with deep pockets uh, when the regulators are often, if not always, un outgunned. And uh, this kind of leads to, to another hypothesis that ASIC is soft on the big end of town and prefers instead to take action against small fry, so smaller companies and operators who are cheaper and easier to pursue. So collectively, these problems suggest a lack of clarity in regular um, regulator responsibility and that some organisations are just too big to tackle effectively. So what are regulators doing? And how likely is it that alternative approaches will be successful in holding directors and senior executives to account and or in having an impact on corporate governance and culture? Well, one of the mechanisms that are being deployed are these GCA reviews. And we've seen an example with APRA and the CBA, followed by the enforceable undertaking that was reached between APRA and the CBA. Now, although enforceable undertakings were criticised by the Hain Royal Commission, they were used primarily to deal with large organisations to resolve misconduct by them, uh, on the basis mainly that they merely acknowledged asset concerns, they made no admissions of wrongdoing, which gave rise to the mindset that they were no more than the cost of doing business. The EU that was entered into between APRA and the CBA is quite different. Importantly, um, it required the CBA to formulate a remedial action plan to fix the problems that had been identified, to submit it to APRA, and then to periodic reviews by an independent reviewer that is promontory to ensure that it was implemented. In terms of the effectiveness of this process, CBA is apparently a success story. APRA and Promontory have been satisfied with CBA's progress in completing its, its remedial plan, with Promontory having issued its third and 13th, I should say, and final report in September 2021. And there's also been that removal um, of the um, risk billion dollar risk capital overlay. And, and the, the fact that um, ASIC, APRA, sorry, the, the fact that um, the CBA, the APRA, I should say, took its time in removing that capital outlay suggests that APRA has been focused on uh, whether the change at CBA is sustained and sustainable. The other point I think to highlight is what Commissioner Hayne actually said about the CBA um, inquiry. Um, and, and he said it was an important development in both APRA's approach to CGA risks and for regulated entities, providing a very valuable publicly available account of how GCA failures can drive misconduct and wider prudential risks and how to deal with them. However, as for Crown and other casino operators such as Star, it's very unlikely that the EU like that agreed with CBA could be duplicated for them. And this is because state gambling regulators have much less experience than APRA in overseeing systemic risk issues. Further, in June 2022, when Crown was given approval to open its Sydney casino at Barangaroo, while it was subject to conditions, those conditions were never made public, unlike the um, EU between APRA and the CBA. The regulators and the government have also seen more intent on keeping Crown and Star in business to avoid the negative economic impacts on the states, but it does raise questions about the independence of regulators, regulatory capture, and also the adequacy of a state-based regulatory system in the gaming sector that also has the potential to miss systemic issues across the sector, particularly because you've got customers who are mobile, who could be visiting multiple state uh, casinos in you know, short periods of time. Now, just quickly, another mechanism, um, and I haven't covered them all, but, but uh, I thought I'd cover ASIC's close and continuous monitoring program, which was where it installed um, 
regulatory staff in the big four banks and AMP to monitor their governance and compliance practices. The idea for it came from the, a model that's used in the Netherlands, which involves the regulator sending in organisational psychologists to work within organisations to identify cultural problems um, or risks, um, especially by those in leadership positions that may lead to non-compliance. So uh, where there's a tolerance of misconduct or rewarding excessive risk taking by top performers. And in fact, uh, a psychologist did actually sit in on board meetings um, under this program. But in terms of how effective it is, um, programs like the CCM program or the involvement of organisational psychologists in the boardroom, how effective they are is, is, is largely unexplored. Um, what I've tried to do here is leave you with three takeaways for directors and executives, um, and they are that no organisation is immune from wrongdoing. It's not enough to have official policies that, that profess uh, compliance with the law and regulatory requirements if um, an organisation's practices don't align and they have a culture of not applying them. Changing beh behaviour and culture is admittedly very difficult, but it can be done as we've seen with the CBA, uh, facilitated by the, um, the, the CGA review and also the um, EU that was subsequently entered. And also CBA itself, which was open and, to, to, and also committed to change. I think that's um, also really, really important, if not probably the most important thing. Um, as far as regulators are concerned, even though they operate in a limited resource environment and there are so many challenges uh, facing uh, legal enforcement action, to remain credible, regulators must be seen to be taking legal act, some type of legal enforcement action, criminal um, or at the very least civil penalties um, in appropriate cases, especially against large corporations and their um, directors and senior executives to demonstrate its willingness to hold them to account for poor behaviour. Additionally, they should continue to use more deep dive CBA style um, investigations and trial new techniques and mechanisms that are aimed at improving the culture of corporations such as the CCM program, uh, which seek to pick up on cultural risks before, wrongdo before the wrongdoing occurs. In other words, before the horse is bolted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to um, hand over now to Jamie. That's great. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so thank you for making your way over here on a wet day, and it's, it's really lovely to be here. I'm going to take a bit of a different um, slant on the topic, very consistent with a lot of the messages that Vicky brought through, but really from a, a stance of a practitioner who's been in banks, been in organisations where things have gone gone the wrong way um, and also now working with EY where I'm also consulting to many of the financial institutions and seeing it up, up live. The first thing I'd like to just really make the point is that it's not a unique story in Australia that you have failings like this. So um, throughout the world, there's been a massive wave of enforcement and fines for a range of different reasons, um, really coming out post the financial crisis into today and then what we've had since really our Royal Commission is a wave on that. So really two big waves back before the financial crisis and into, into what we've got here locally. Um, and there's many and varied ways where organisations get this wrong. So they go from the AMO and sanctions, which is what we've seen here in Australia and what started with HSBC and JP and others. Um, you've had LIBOR, which is really cartel type behaviours around chats. You've had subprime issues, you've had tax issues, conflicts of interest, mis-selling, product governance, things going wrong. So there's many and varied ways that banks can get wrong. They're complicated organisations and they do a lot of, they touch a lot of the, a lot of customers. And it, when, in hindsight, when you look back at practices, um, after there's been big events, you tend to find it hasn't really been run as well or as safely as you might think. So we'll unpack a little bit about why that happens. A um, bit of perspective on myself and, and the vantage point I bring to this discussion. So um, I was the, as, as uh, Simon mentioned, the legal and compliance head 
of Standard Chartered Bank globally through the financial crisis and through um, a very big event that happened um, in Standard Chartered where there was AML um, and sanctions issues that went back to 2007, so before um, I joined, but they sort of came through and translated and were, were uncovered in post periods. And that then resulted in um, enforcement action by the US Department of Financial Services, the UK, as well as the UK, US Department of Justice, and over a billion US of fines ensued from that. Just like we've seen with CBA and others, there was also an independent party brought in to basically oversee the program of remediation that was run by Standard Chartered, and that was a, an external monitor called Navigant who came in. So, And on the back of that, there was a sea change of investment, a sea change of how the organisation behaved and what it thought was important. Um, I had probably the unusual situation where I saw that way, which was post-financial crisis, and then I returned to Australia after 10 years in um, Singapore and came in and joined Westpac. Um, and I was the Chief Compliance Officer for Westpac over the period of the Austrac matter. So again, bit of a similar story. You've had legacy issues, they've been uncovered and you've gone through. You've had, in this case, um, like CBA, a CGA brought in and an external party brought in, um, which is promontory to overview the program. Now, all my comments that I take from now on are not attributable to any particular organisation. They're an amalgam of many organisations I've, I've had perspective in and consulted with and worked with. So, and I, I'd, I'd hasten to add that, you know, the people in these banks are not trying to do the wrong thing. They're complicated beasts to run and these things happen. So let's get into why do organisations get it wrong? What are the reasons that we have these sort of blow ups? And the, the, probably the first one is you can get your strategic settings wrong. So you haven't got a balanced view of profit and risk, and you've gone too skewed one way or the other. You're trying to drive your cost to income ratio down to an unsustainable level. You're cost cutting everything. You're not investing and doing the gardening that's required. What's going on? That's fine. Thank you. Um, the second thing is you have your financial settings wrong. So you're really prioritising the financial returns over the non-financial risk. So you pay a lot of attention to credit because you're going to lose money. You pay a lot of attention to liquidity or capital because they're part of what really sustains your ability to have your licence. But op risk or compliance or fin crime is a bit more esoteric, a bit less easy to understand how it'll hit. And that takes a lot of education to understand how these, these risks really play out and what needs to be true to manage them. You get organisations that are complacent, they don't have a lot of new blood, There's a, people have been there for 30 years. It's always been like this. Despite the movie that happened overseas, no one's really seen the movie here. Um, and, you know, so don't, or if they've seen the movie, it could never happen here. It's really that mindset. Um, there's a mismatch between the capabilities that you might have in your risk and compliance term in your business, all the all the bonuses, all the you know the key roles, all the rah rah and the rewards go to the first line and the business people, and the the back office is left as, and called back office, called less of a partner, more of a an organisation that's really catching up and just trying to trying to play the role. Um, the other thing I'll say is risk management is just hard. A lot needs to go right to get it to work culturally, to get the nose to work, to get the organisation to basically knit it all together. And there's so many different ways that a system can go wrong. You don't report this, you, you miss this data feed and you breach the regulation. There are a lot of regulations. There's a lot of ways that you can be in situations that are not ideal. Um, when you get to the root cause of this, you have to go a bit deeper. And one thing that APRA has pushed through the CGA is to really go to root cause. It's not just about the surface of what went wrong. It's what was the underpinning? What actually happened? What was driving the behaviours? And, um, and that's cultural. It's deeply cultural. Um, often it's too much focus on short term. So we, we need to hit our quarter. We need to hit the next quarter. No one's looking out that few years and saying, over time we've eroded this system or that capability. Um, this not enough focus on what things go wrong or there's not the right culture to raise things and actually address them. Bit of a good news story, you know, we don't want to hear this, so don't raise it up. Um, and 
your risk management framework can be ineffective unless it's really understood and really ingrained in the organisation. And the risk management framework is kind of everything in a bank. And people don't really understand, a lot of people wouldn't understand what a risk management framework is, but it's the settings right from the board. What is your risk appetite? What are your measures for that? What are your policies around your risks? How are you driving the right behaviours all the way through the organisation? And having that really clear from top to bottom and everyone's role in that is really important and bringing that to life rather than just having a document that the risk officer really understands, but no one else does. And that doesn't really work. So all of that really comes back to the fundamental underpinning of most of these phases is risk culture. And whether that risk culture is a balanced culture between you know, sensible profit motive with a risk management and that you keep that at the front of everything. You don't just go too far tilted one way or the other. Got the problem again. So I just thought I'd distill um, from my experience what good and poor governance looks like. And it's probably a bit more homespun. It's just the type of characteristics that I've noticed over the journey. The first one is that you know it's a good culture when leaders understand their risks, when they can talk about the risk, when they worry about their compliance or conduct risk or their financial crime or they worry about their credit. They've got a view that that's what makes their business tick. They're not just worried about the revenue and saying, I've got my product, what's my pricing, how do I get that to work, and saying it's somebody else's job to do that. They're the people who really try to keep it all in balance. And the best leaders can do that. And there's a lot of them who can, but there's also people who don't do that. Um, as I mentioned, the risk management framework is front and centre. People understand their role in it. It's not just a theoretical construct that people think is the risk team's job. And, and that's really important, as I mentioned before. Um, when you go to a board or an executive risk committee, which there's a lot of them, um, they're testing, they're substantive, you're getting difficult. You shouldn't be going as a chief compliance officer to any board governance committee and just talking and no one asking questions. It should be a really challenging testing environment. And you should know that people are really interested in the topic, whether it's uh, if it's on risk and it's not just about, you know, don't tell me this stuff, okay? Um, a sceptical mindset, that opposite of that insularity. It, it could happen here. What's the best practice? What has happened before? Can we test that? Can we do a bit of a SWOT approach and go, okay, what could be the worst thing that could go wrong in this scenario? Um, not just think, well, it's never happened to us before, so it's not going to happen again. And constructive relationships between you know, your first and second and third line. By that, we mean the first line is rough, basically the business, people who run the business. The second line is people like me. Um, they're the compliance people, the risk officers, the people who sit there, they set the policies, but they've also got an obligation to test and challenge and monitor and call out things that don't work. Uh, and then you've got an audit function who has the role to periodically and with some system go through the organisation and test on an audit basis what's going on. Each of those lines is important. If you're the second line, you need to have audit looking at you to make sure that you're doing your job, but they also provide that backstop over the whole lot. Now, what you want to see is a sense of partnership between that first and second line. You want to see a sense they want you in the room. They want that advisory capability. They want it to, to work really constructively. The opposite to that is where people go, well, you know, you just trouble, you know, compliance is the thought police, um, you know, we don't want you, you know, do your job but don't get in our way sort of thing. So it's a very different mindset and one's really um, productive and a really great place to work and the other's a real battle every day. Um, finally, the, the receptiveness to bad news, to speak up culture, that's not just whistleblowing or the ability to have a program, which is very important, but it's in the day-to-day -day interactions where a business leader stands up and where he's challenged or where information comes, how that reacts, how that person reacts at any given time, how they go about encouraging people to say, yes, I want to know, is a very different cultural message um, compared to the alternative, which is, you know, could never happen here, move on sort of thing. So there's different ways of reacting to that and good cultures really encourage that information. And I always say that in an organisation, if you've got, 
in, in some of the organisations, 20,000 people with the opportunity to speak up, then you're, you're unlikely to get these massive failures. You're going to pick them up on the way um, because people will raise them up and you'll address them. If you don't have that, then you have these latencies and things that go wrong. Uh, finally, one more. So, and that's the ability to react when things go wrong. Things will go wrong in a bank. You will get it wrong. You will get it wrong in most organisations. So then do you acknowledge that, correct it, take the right action, move on, take the right consequences, that's right, if people behave badly, and then you start driving the right that people want to know and they'll take action. It's also very, very important. Oh, I just thought I'd turn a little bit to learnings from remediation efforts. So the, the CGAs that Vicky's talked about, people going in and making and running programs to basically um, correct where they've got a, a challenge from some kind of issue. So the first thing to say is when you have a program like this, the funding is exponentially higher than what you had before. When, it, when No one really does to themselves what happens in these EUs or these reactions. You tend to have a disproportionate approach to making sure you do everything to the, the proper standard and you don't cut any corners. So the funding, the resourcing, the focus just goes up and that's a inherently positive thing where you're trying to correct an organisation. Um, it requires whole of firm education. It's no point just educating the board or the compliance function or the risk function. You've got to get right through the business. So you do a lot of education, a lot of programs where you're actually out there really communicating what it is that you're trying to achieve. You'll have a centralised program and you'll set that up and you have a very disciplined approach to setting out your goals. What are the um, deliverables you've got to set out and how do you embed that and prove it? And, you know, the rigour on this and the sign-offs that go through are really, really um, intense. Um, there's first-line accountability. So the business has to take the lead in a lot of this work. It's not just for the, the risk teams to take it. It's got to be driven by the business. And as Vicky said, tone from the top sort of everything. It's got to be cascaded down. It's got to be done consistently throughout the organisation. The final thing, it's really hard to prove that you've actually embedded, done it, succeeded. It takes time. These things can take multiple years. You know, Vicky alluded to the positive report that Promontory put out. And, and I think all of that is absolutely valid. And, it's, and they've made a big progress, but it's taken them two to three years. So it takes that sort of time to move the culture. I'll just make one other observation on, on the CGAs, and that's I, I do see them as a really positive regulatory tool, and I think APRA is using them very, very wisely in how they go about it. And they're not just using it in the public way. They're using this concept of a root cause analysis and a culture governance accountability review in, in a number of their supervisory um, engagements. So... Uh, they're asking organisations to get to root cause. They're testing culture and risk culture particularly. So that drive, I think, is a really the right direction to correct some of these things. And the, the features of these, these CGAs tend to be an independent firm, someone coming in with an outside in view to help with that root cause, test that, have you got it deep enough, have you got the right view? Um, it is that focus on the root cause and the cultural. Um, Board and CEO sponsorship is absolutely required. So they're on the hook for the delivery of any of these programs. It will require a very large scale response, depending on the organisation, proportionate to that. Um, and it's going to be outcomes based. So you don't get out of these things until you can start proving that the, the organisation's moved on. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, I suppose, a, a dimension that adds to Vicky's thoughts on how this plays out in practice. And I think now we're ready to take a seat and take any questions that you may have from all of that. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, that was a, a fantastic uh, uh, tandem team uh, um, presentation or a tag team presentation. 
uh, with a really good melding of, of the kind of history, uh, of where we are at the moment in our um, uh, how we go about regulating uh, corporations. And then I think the operational question of, of how big organisations, um, which I would extend to include universities, I have to say, uh, it's um, it, every, every time I look at these kind of questions, I instantly see pretty much my daily lived reality as a dean. Um, not that we're engaging in money laundering or anything like that, um, but there are risks, uh, regulatory risks, and how you best deal with it, and and what is a good culture and what is a bad culture. And I think, you know, uh, I think good cultures, when I see it, are ones where you can ask um, uncomfortable questions. Um, uh, and uh, not um, uh, punish the messenger, uh, which I think is a tendency in, in organizational terms. Um, I'm very happy to open up to the floor for questions. Professor Yane Svetiev, colleague from Sydney Law School. So when I do, um, I've just introduced him, but you can always identify yourself when you... Thank you very much uh, to the speaker. So I'm, I'm Yane Svetiev and I'm a professor here of market regulation. Um, and uh, so I, I, I work in kind of uh, different fields of market regulation, including uh, in these different approaches through which you can enforce uh, the rules. And I was wondering whether I could provoke a kind of a set of other dichotomies to the ones that were in the presentations that the two of you made. So, um, you know, one suggested dichotomy between the two examples in the Commonwealth Bank and in Crown Casino was that in one, the conduct was not intentional, whereas in the other one, it was. And here we sort of confront the difficulty of, you know, identifying corporate intentions and, uh, you know, all of those very familiar debates. And I wonder whether a different way to think about the dichotomy is that in the case of the conduct of the bank, in any particular instance of potentially wrongful conduct, you know, the, the transaction could have been both legitimate and have, you know, a kind of a, a legitimate economic purpose and it could have been illegal as well. And so, you know, because the nature of the activity is that you know, what, what a bank does generally can contribute to, uh, you know, some social or economic objectives. In any particular instance, there is a kind of an ambiguity about the, the effect of the conduct uh, that makes it much more difficult to uh, discern whether there is a, uh, um, a contravention or not, as opposed to in the case of a casino where kind of like, you know, the, the the purposeful element is actually very very difficult to kind of identify maybe uh, of the underlying activity uh, and so then you know it's much easier to see that you know there is a uh, there is wrongful conduct going on um, and so I wonder whether that's a kind of useful uh, different way to think about you know the, the the difference between the two examples and then in terms of risk culture I guess that dichotomy also becomes important because the question becomes, you know, is it a risk tolerance just because there is a kind of a potential of rule breaking, but without any real harmful conduct, uh, or whether it's a risk culture that's attuned to real problems and harmful conduct rather than merely rule breaking, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, in the work of Mar Malcolm Sparrow, you know, he says, you know, if you're, if you're risk oriented, you're trying to prevent harm rather than trying to prevent rule breaking in and of itself. Um, look, uh, there have been some um, other arguments put forward, for example, in the case of Crown. I noticed that Penny Crofts isn't here anymore. <laughs> she, she was here earlier, but she's written an article about Crown where she states that Crown is an example of state corporate crime, that, you know, the Bergen Inquiry, for example, which was the first 
uh, Commission of Inquiry into Crown framed everything around governance failures. It was seen as, you know, poor culture, governance uh, failures and risk and, and risk failures. But in, in that article, she makes a really powerful case that it, it's um, Crown is an example of what she, of what this uh, of this phenomenon state uh, corporate cr crime, where, for example, there is um, soft touch regulation, uh, where the onus is on with responsible gambling, the onus is on the individual, um, where the the uh, state and the regulators are earning huge amounts of money from gambling. Um, that, for example, um, Crown Melbourne was known as the Vatican um, in that uh, pol state politicians, Victorian politicians and the uh, police wouldn't uh, enforce the law there. It was treated like a separate city state uh, where the rules didn't apply. So there, there are, you know, there is research going on that is questioning the sort of the, the framework that we've worked with tonight, which is that, um, you know, um, although I tried to allude to the fact that things may have been different at Crown because of this culture that actively um, seemed to encourage risk-taking in, in financial crime. But some people have gone further and argued that it really is criminal behaviour. But unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, well, uh, it depends on your view, but um, ASIC... Um, hasn't taken any action against Crown or against its individual directors, uh, despite the, you know, very critical reports. Um, Austrac's only brought civil penalty proceedings, not criminal proceedings. But for regulators, they're in a real conundrum too, in that if they don't bring proceedings, they're criticised. If they do and they lose, and that's very... Um, that's on the cards when they're dealing with large organisations, well-resourced defendants, they still get criticised. So I don't really know where the answer lies. I might touch on your second question, which is really the, the question of harm and conduct. And uh, look, I think organisations, I think, do look to prioritise their risk management around where the outcomes are going to be most adverse. But that doesn't give any organisation a free pass to say it can break the rules that don't have the same link to harm. So the legislator puts in place the laws and the organisations still need to respect them and they can be quite penal. So, um, you know, in terms of the non-harm issues can still have very significant consequences. So I don't think that's a, I think it's, it's a prioritisation, but it's not, enough to say I'll just look at outcomes. I need to look at obeying the law in, in, in this in the round. Thanks. I uh, Catherine Maxwell from Governance Institute. I'd be interested in your take because ASIC's taken proceedings just before Christmas um, against STAR and against 11 directors and officers. Um, so do you think that's as a result of criticism or what's your take on why they've suddenly? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I think they need to be seen uh, to, to you know, be trying to bring wrongdoers to account. Um, but also ASIC has been very careful in the way it's framed its statement of claim against the directors in the, uh, against the star directors. So the statement of claim is framed very narrowly and because in the past, um, that has been ASIC's downfall too, where it, it hasn't um, uh, stated its case um, in, in clear enough terms, like the case against uh, um, um, the iron ore magnate in um, Western Australia, um, Forrest, um, that case went to the High Court and there was criticism of the way ASIC brought that case. I mean, that was in respect of statements that he'd made about um, to the stock market about uh, binding agreements having been made with Chinese um, companies to build infrastructure for, I think it was the Pilbara mines. Uh, but ASIC lost that case on the basis that it hadn't 
framed the action clearly enough. So I think um, because it didn't bring a, a case against the Crown directors, and I think that was also complicated by the fact that Blackstone has taken over uh, Crown um, and we don't know what changes are being made and, and also it's, it's a private equity firm. Um, and, and yes, so uh, it, it needs to, I think it needed to be seen to be doing something. And it'll be interesting to see what the outcome of that decision will be against the uh, star directors. I think I've got the microphone. Uh, Victor Kerr, barrister at the back here. Um, just picking up on your comments about ASIC and failure to prosecute or bring civil um, penalty proceedings, uh, do you suggest that there are breaches of legislation or, or arguable breaches of legislation, contraventions of legislation that are under ASIC's purview? And we're looking at the Corporations Act, I assume. And if so, what are the sorts of contraventions you suggest ASIC might have brought that it did not? Well, in relation to the directors, the star directors, it's bringing um, an action against them for breach of their duties. So in relation to um, directors have certain duties, such as the, the duty of care, so to take uh, care and diligence in the performance of their duties. And that seems to be the duty that features prominently in the case law. In a lot of the successful cases against the directors of um, the James Hardy directors, for example, the... Um, uh, the, the one-tell directors, although ASIC had more limited success there. Um, so uh, those kind of actions seem to be uh, successful. Unfortunately, there haven't been, um, or ASIC's found it very hard to bring cases based on the other duty to act bona fide in the best interests of the company. So the duty of care, which is found in section 180 of the Corporations Act, seems to be the, the uh, the basis upon which ASIC is bringing many actions against the directors for breach of their duties, such as in the Star case. Yeah, it's probably worth noting that looking forward, um, yeah, Bear and Far um, will bring in different avenues. Um, obviously, these events, by definition, have all happened before that legislation, or the legislation doesn't apply in that sector. But you know, I think that's the accountability that directors are feeling quite acutely. Um, in their day-to-day -day actions today and decisions today. Can I just add something there? I, I agree. Um, under the BEAR, which is the, what is it, the Banking Executive Accountability Regime, soon to be called the FAR, the financial, what is it, financial? Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to have a wider application. One of the things that was um, seen to be a critical problem um, by the Hain Royal Commission were remuneration um, systems where senior executives and directors weren't um, uh, penalised at all for bad behaviour, whereas under the bear there is an ability that um, their remuneration, their remuneration can be deferred if there are bad bad out outcomes. So I think bear really has got some bite, and if it's enforced, um, that's I think that's a good good way of. Um, uh, achieving some kind of accountability and dealing with that problem of uh, remuneration packages seeming to um, inappropriate uh, reward inappropriate behaviour. Actually, I might stand so you're not trying to look semi. Um, hi, thank you, uh, Vicky and Jamie, for your speech. My name's Dr. Dylan Koshot. I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of Sydney Law School and amongst other things for my sins, convener of our course on anti-corruption law. So great interest in this subject. Um, question related to the, more to the CBA rather than Crown, looking at some of different kinds of conduct. Um, and if I can sort of add possibly a secondary hypothesis, another hypothesis to yours, Vicky's, which Jamie might know whether or not this is correct, that our, our anti-money laundering rules unlike the rest of the world, were principally motivated around taxation issues and revenue. The rest of the world's more organised crime. Ours came up more as a revenue issue. FATF made that observation in 1998. Um, my, my hypothesis I pose is this, this isn't so much a governance failure with respect to these cases early on, but that it's a regulatory failure in the context of our legislation was brought in the context of chasing you know, tax tax avoiders. 
um, and not so much regulating proper anti-money laundering issues. So with respect to what happened in the CBA and what's happened to other banks since then, is it more a matter of that we've gone into sort of the anti-money laundering framework thinking in the context of, well, this is more of a revenue issue. It's more about tax issues. We don't need to think about this in terms of policing these issues in the banks. So the banks didn't really think about it. Then all of a sudden it became an issue and the banks are being told to play catch up when in reality, it was the government and the regulators that did a bad job of sort of flagging with them earlier in advance that this is something they should be looking at. So my question is, is this possibly what happened that led to this, these sorts of events, particularly in the CBA case, because that was one of the earlier ones, or am I sort of just thinking, no? Uh, I'm, I'll, have to, I'll be careful. I'm not going to comment on any particular bank or who would be potentially a client of EY, but... Um, what I would say on that is um, th there is across the world a fairly um, consistent standard on what you need to do to protect against money laundering. And there's a large community who understand that, the, the due diligence, the transaction monitoring, the processes you need. Um, our legislation allows for that. It, 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 there's some bits that are more specific on certain areas than others. I don't think it's a legislative falling. I think what you've had is very little enforcement of those standards over a long period of time. So when you get to Tabcorp, I think, you know, $80 million, maybe seven, eight years ago, whatever it was, and then you sort of jump to $700 million at, at um, CBA and then $1.4 billion at... So you've had this enforcement inflation. But don't forget that in, I think it was 2006 or something, HSBC was signed, fined $2 billion. So we just didn't have the same teeth or approach um, of enforcement that the global community had. And that change has now put everyone on notice that the fines are real. Like the, there are $11 million per incident fines in the legislation. It's not a matter of teeth. It's a matter of what's the standard the regulator seeking to drive in the market, bearing in mind that, you know, there's a very inconsistent approach across the market. You know, I would hazard to say that some of these banks that had enforced will be at the top now of any standards and there'll be others who are bringing themselves up. But there's a lot of resource. There's a finite number of AML professionals. There's a finite number of, you know, IT and other people to drive this. And it's, it's lifting up, but it takes time. Uh, my name is Ganesh Lahadev, and I'm a graduate of this university, and I've done a bit of work in the AML CTF area. And one of my recent cases, when I say cases, uh, gets a bit complicated. But anyway, Standard Chartered, uh, if not for the ability of the Department of Justice, uh, US Department of Justice to seize assets, Standard Chartered would not have got fined for that issue. Am I right, Mr. Kelly? <laughs> Oh, no, no, I don't think that's the only reason. Like standard chartered, standard chartered, you know, had sanctions issues that they, it conceded in a court of law. So I don't want to go into the detail of that, but I... Yes, but that's a well-known case. There, there was public. There was, you know, there's certain features of the US economy and US dollar clearing that made it very important for standard chartered to maintain its regulatory licenses, et cetera. And they definitely played into the the tension of the matter, but... You know, um, as I say, like standard chart is just one of 30 banks who've yes, had decent I, fines yeah, yeah, on You realise that, but you're here. Uh, so the last point on that is that seems to be the way to go. I mean, otherwise it you know becomes this Anglo-Saxon uh, preoccupation with debate, counter-debate, which achieved nothing, whereas the DOJ's capacity to seize assets, make the assets the plaintiff in the case, was what sought that issue. Again, that's a matter of public record, quite well reported. Well, look, um, I'm conscious that we're um, uh, at the at the time, and I know people may well want to ask questions, and I, but we do have an opportunity to continue conversations, and our speakers are ha hanging around, so there'll be f opportunities for further um, uh, discussion over a uh, over a drink. Um, uh, I, look, I, I think 
you've set an, a, an amazing um, uh, benchmark here for uh, for future. Let's talk about corporations. Um, I think uh, this is an ongoing uh, question about the, the balance between prevention, how much energy. I wish we put um, more attention into, in a sense, shifting corporate cultures, organizational cultures, um, to be more attentive to those risks uh, and to educate. Um, and I, I think it sadly it takes a, a, a scandal and a, and a crisis to bring about change. It'd be great uh, for the shareholders too if we could embed that. It's better to spend the money up front than 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 in remediation. Um, but look, it's a great balance of of learning about these these um, uh, what the medics would call sentinel events, um, major major cases of of controversy, and and what policy and and practice insights we can can draw. Please join with me in thanking our wonderful presenters, Vicky and Jamie. I would like also to acknowledge our events team who have made this possible tonight. Uh, Ashley here who has been running around making sure that uh, not only uh, people in the room but also online have been able to uh, enjoy this presentation. So thank you very much.